hang on one minute there, Derek. We're approaching a very significant time and a very important time that we identify that fixing to enter into the time of Passover and also celebrate the resurrection. Of all the people of the world, of all the religions of the world. Let me state this. Of all the people of the world and all the religions of the world, there is none, zero, that can state and stand on the claim and the promise that he's not dead, but he's risen. Nobody else. Nobody else. Because he lives. Therefore, you shall live also. As Jesus was suspended on the cross of Calvary. He said, it is finished. It was not a cry of defeat. It was not just a cry of agony. It was actually a cry, the victor's cry. That what had been owed has now been paid in full. That when Jesus hung upon the cross of Calvary, and when he said it is finished, he was saying the debt for sin is paid in full. Hallelujah. I want to think it might have been Pilate that said that it was destined that a man should die for the people. To die for somebody is one thing. I think about this so often. Because any religious leader, anybody could stake a claim that I'm going to die for you. And probably in the past and through the years, there's been some people that have made the claim that I'm dying for you. I would die for you. It's not just enough to die for a person, but we also must know that the sacrifice or the payment that was made had been received. So Jesus died on the cross of Calvary. He said he died for my sins. But he didn't stop there. Death is not the end of it. He said he died for my sins. But he was raised again for my justification. Because if he was to only die for us, we would still be in wonder and would still be confused is he who he said he was was the sacrifice accepted was he without sin because the only way the sacrifice would be accepted was going to be through a man that had no sin so how do we know that the sacrifice has been accepted let me just show, tell a story, short story. The, the, the priest would go into the Holy of Holies. And as he went in, if he was not right, he didn't come back out. And so it left the people on the outside that they had put so much into this priest that we are dependent on you to go before God for us to intercede and stand in our behalf only to stand on the outside. Man, can you imagine that you waited all year long for this time? You, you, you waited and you, and you raised up and you took the best animal that you had and you was carried to the sacrifice only to get there and the priest didn't come back out. They would leave you in dispense what happened was my was my sacrifice accepted but you can stand victorious today because in a week from today we're going to celebrate what we call easter the resurrection so how do i know today that the sacrifice that was made on my behalf had been accepted by god it's because when the Mary went to the tomb and the angel had rolled away 
city. They said, why seek ye the living among the dead? In other words, that sacrifice has been accepted by God. Amen. No other, no other, no, nobody else can stake claims to what we can stake claims for. The God whom we serve, he's not dead. He's alive. He's alive forevermore. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for me and you. Come on, let's go one more time. We're going to go back to that bridge, but before we do, I want you to think of something. God, he just described this perfect God who'd done all this stuff for us. In the Bible, it tells us how to pray. It says, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, I want you to think what it's like in heaven. How are they praising Jesus? What's going on in this church right now is not how they are praising Jesus. I can promise you that there's going to be no shame. There's going to be no worry. There's going to be nothing but free worship in him. And I want to proclaim that in this church this morning, that as we sing, oh, praise the one who paid my debt, raised his life up from the dead. That is something awesome right there. Let's just sing this. Praise the one who paid my debt, to raise his life up from the dead. Lord, praise the one who paid my debt, to raise his life up. Excuse me because my voice is uh is a, a lot gone but don't worry I promise you I'll give you everything I got <clears throat> you have to if I had to stop and take a swallow of water today just please excuse me for that and I do have a cough drop in my mouth so excuse me for that too this morning we serve an awesome God we is fixing to celebrate Easter the resurrection of our Savior Hallelujah. I want this morning to turn to your, get your Bibles, and I want you to turn to the book of Joshua, chapter 1. And I want to read verses 1 through 9. Uh, this has been a word that's been on me, I've written probably since I left here Sunday. I didn't come here to share a word, I come here because I got a word. Amen. And uh, I believe you're going to be encouraged by this. And I want you to... I want to speak to you this morning on a topic that I've entitled, It Ain't Over Yet. And uh, probably if my English teacher probably wouldn't like that grammar too much, but I figured you would grab a hold to that. You know, it's something catchy and you, nothing else. People sit around the dinner table and say, well, he didn't have too much good. He didn't, his grammar was not too good. But the thing about it is you remembered what I spoke on. It ain't over yet. Very interesting story that I'm fixing to read to you. It starts in the book of Joshua, chapter 1. There's about to be an exchange in what we was of leadership here. And now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass, the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. I want you to notice verse 2. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise and go over this Jordan, thou and all this people unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses." From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even to the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea, towards the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage. 
For unto this people thou shalt divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper wheresoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy ways prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. Notice the last part. For the Lord thy God is with thee, wheresoever thou goest. The Lord thy God is with thee, wheresoever thou goest. There was two things that I want to look at as we start this. Before let's do, let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the reading of your word. And Father, we ask God for the blessings and God for on the reading of your word as it goes forth and as it has went forth this morning. Father, we pray for a manifestation of your anointing, Lord, to rest upon us as we proclaim your word today. Father, give us strength. God, let my voice proclaim that which you have laid in my heart this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's two things that I want to look at containing this passage of scripture this morning. The first one was found in verse 2, where it says, My servant, Moses, my servant, is dead. I want you, if you somehow or another, either put that visually in your mind and remember it, make a mental note of this in verse 2, that he's speaking unto Joshua, and he tells him that Moses is dead. And the last verse that we read in verse 9, it says, For the Lord thy God is with thee, wheresoever thou goest. In other words, he was telling Joshua, there won't be a place that you go that I won't be with you. Come on, somebody. He says, you will not find yourself in a situation that I will not be there. You will not go and face the Hittites or the Amorites. You will not face Jericho that I will not be there. He says, wherever you go, whether it's in the midnight hour, if it's early in the morning, or if it's late at night, no matter what kind of enemies rise up against you, no matter how big that they are, and no matter what kind of background that they have, you will absolutely go no place that I will not be with you. It's great news to know today that the God has promised in his word that he would never leave us nor forsake us. That you will never find yourself in a place that he's not able to get you out of. The first part was my servant Moses is dead. I thought about this and I thought about this in relationship to the children of Israel. And as I was thinking about this, I thought, what a tragic event to take place about Moses. Who is this man? We've heard about him from the time that we, even as little toddlers in daycare and church, and as we moved from there to Sunday school, we've heard just as much teachings about Moses as we have about anybody else throughout church. We've heard preachers preach about him. We've heard Sunday school teachers tell about him. We got coloring books that our kids colored about Moses. Moses, a mighty man of God. Moses, I'm going to tell you a little story about him, and we're going to set the foundation down with this. Because Moses was a great man. Moses was a man that God had used to do extremely mighty things. He's even as a little bitty boy, they had took Moses, his mama had took him and tried to save his life, put him in a little old basket and put him out into the river. When she was trying to save his life, God had a plan that he was about to save his people. You're not with me. God knew the end from the beginning. 
And in the midst of Moses' life, they put him in a little basket because they had got word that Pharaoh was going to kill all the little kids. So his mama takes him and puts him in a little basket and puts him in the river. A woman finds him. One of Pharaoh's women. When, she, when his mama had plans to save his life, God had a plan to save his people. God's always got a plan. There's absolutely nothing that's taking place in your life right now that caught him by surprise. There's nothing that caught him off guard. Maybe if we use this analogy sometimes, you ever told somebody something and it, and it surprised them and it shocked them and they said, man, I didn't know that. Maybe y'all have never been surprised. Somebody tell you something and it, it's unbelievable. And you say, man, I, how did that happen? I want to tell you this morning, there is absolutely nothing that has taken place in your life that has surprised you that surprised God. He's not sitting on a throne and all of a sudden, bam, and he goes, I don't know what we're going to do. I'm shocked by this. I didn't know this was going to happen. I want to tell you, he knows the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning. And there's absolutely nowhere that you go that he's not there. Moses, mighty man that God was using, all of a sudden moves him from the river and moves him up into the house of Pharaoh. Who better to deliver the Israelite people than somebody that's been on the inside that knows the Egyptian dialect, who knows all their terminology and has been raised in the schools of the Egyptian people. He knows their background. He knows their history. And God has moved him from the river and has placed him into the house of Pharaoh. All of a sudden, the Lord speaks unto him after years had passed by and says, I'm going to use you to be the man that's going to deliver Israel out of the hands of this oppressor, the taskmaster or slave master. So now Moses, I'm going to use you Moses thought, boy, the calling's a great calling. God is going to use me to do great things. And the next day or so he goes out and he finds where an Egyptian is doing something wrong to an Israelite. He takes it into his own hands. I want to tell you something. Let me just stop here. Even though that God's got a plan, you've got to get on his timing. Even though that God had called him to deliver, it was the wrong time. And so the people began to talk about Moses. And Moses went inside and he packed his old bags and his luggage and he, he was running. I've got to get out of here. They found out that I'm a murderer now. What are they going to do to me when they find me? And Moses finds himself in a wilderness for 40 years. There's a long time from the time that God calls Moses and his plan for his life until the time he brings his plan to past. It's years that have passed by. Some of us sometimes get discouraged because we have not seen what that which God has laid upon our heart come to pass in a week or two, in a year or two. Imagine 40 plus years in a wilderness holding on to what something you may think is a dead dream. That God has got a calling upon my life. He's called me to rescue and to deliver the Israelite people. He wanders around the wilderness. Are y'all staying with me? Don't, let me? don't let me lose you now. We just laid a foundation down, all right? Going to bring it all to, to, to completion here in a minute. In the wilderness, he's out there. And he walks up and all of a sudden he sees a bush that's burning. Moses. God uses very unique and, you know, you think about well, why didn't God just do it like this? Sometimes you ever thought in your life, why didn't God just do certain things different ways? God just decides to speak from a bush that's burning, but it's not being consumed. Moses, it was there that Moses and that God brought confirmation that you're in the right place and my plan for you has not yet been diminished or been aborted. That I've still got something for you. 
God begins to speak through him from the burning bush. He takes off his shoes from where he's at because he's on holy ground. Moses is sitting there. The Bible says that it tells that he had a speech impediment. Maybe he had a problem talking. Maybe he had a stuttering problem. He skipped a little bit. Y'all remember from another week? Every now and then I get, I get to skipping. And, and he said, who, what, who am I? Who am I to do this? And, the, and he says, what have you got in your hand, Moses? And he said, I've got a rod in my hand. He says, throw that rod on the ground. He threw it on the ground. It become a serpent. He said, pick it back up. I don't know how Moses went at this. And I don't know how he treated this situation. I wouldn't have had no problem throwing the rod down. <laughs> but I might would have thought twice before we picked it back up. He said, pick it back up. And he picked it up and it turned back to a rod. God was speaking unto Moses and was giving Moses confirmation and giving him encouragement that I'm about to do something great in your life and I am able to bring that to pass which I have spoken into your life. He was increasing his faith the whole time. He tells us that I want you to go back into Egypt. He says, and go back and you go back in the house of the man that raised you. You go back and you tell Pharaoh, look him out of high. And you tell him, says, the Lord has said to let my people go. Watch this. Don't you lose this now. Moses shows all the way back up and he gets all the way back into Pharaoh's house. Tells him, said, let my people go. Not by the hair of my chinny chin chin. You can huff and puff all you want to. He said, I tell you what, if you don't let my people go, a play is going to come to this place. There's going to be more frogs in this place than you know what to do with. You like frog legs, you think to have all you want to eat. <laughs> then next thing, plague after plague after plague. Watch this though, watch this. The Israelite people are standing on the outside. And they're seeing this man that God has placed his hand upon. He has come and he's told them, says, I am going to be the man that God is going to use to bring you out of here and to carry you over there. The whole time he's there, the people on the outside, the Israelites sitting there watching Moses. Here is our Savior. Here is our man. We're watching him go into the house of Pharaoh and he's talking to Pharaoh and he's telling him, God has said this and this plague would come. Then, 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 then Pharaoh would back out and he said, I, I let him go, I let him go. Only that when the plague left, he said, I done changed my mind now. It's like a lot of people that just wishy-washy. Y'all ever heard that word? That's an old grandmama word right there. Flies is going to come and locusts is going to come and plagues are going to come. Here's the light people looking on the outside saying, man, here is our man. Here he is. Everything that he proclaims, he's coming and speaking, thus saith the Lord, and it's happening. Nothing's taken place, nothing has released yet, but he comes back and he tells him, says, I tell you what. He said, Pharaoh has not let our people go, but the Lord told him, says, Pharaoh, tonight, the, the, the death angel is going to come to the camp. It's going to slay everybody in his camp. So let my people go. He went home and the Lord had told him, says, I want you to make sure. It was just a foreshadow of what was to come or what we're about to celebrate. He said, take a spotless lamb and I want you to take that blood and put on that doorpost. He said, because when the death angel comes to the camp tonight, it's not going to be looking for one thing. He's going to be looking to see if there's any blood been applied. Come on, I want to tell you this morning. I don't care what Open Winfrey says. I don't care what any kind of national leader says. There's not but one way and there's not but one power. And it's through the blood of Jesus Christ that a man shall be delivered. <laughs> Lord, don't get me started. They took that lamb and they slay it and the death angel came through. Pharaoh wakes up the next morning and his son, his oldest son's dead. I let y'all go, just get out of here. 
Stay with me here. Don't let me lose you. Are y'all still with me? People, they feed, Israel comes out of Egypt and they get down to the Red Sea and all of a sudden in the midst of Pharaoh letting them go, he changes his mind again. Whew. Stay with me here. Just a little brief history lesson. As you do unto the Israelite people, so it shall be done unto you. He had drowned all the little boys. Whew. You're not with me today. They get down to the Red Sea and Pharaoh said, I've changed my mind. I don't want them to go. This is how the devil is sometimes. Or all the time. Just as soon as you make your mind up to leave, he's tracing you, trying to pull you back to his camp. They get down to the Red Sea. Remember this Moses who we're talking about. Moses gets down there. The people are all around him. He's built his confidence up among the people because now they're following him. He has told him, says, God is going to do some great things. God is going to bring us out from over here. And he's turned us to a place with milk and honey. Get down to the Red Sea and all of a sudden Pharaoh's army is all encamped around him. Got him closed in. Nowhere to go. What do we do when there's nowhere to go? The Lord spoke to me and says, Moses, take your rod and go out over the Red Sea. And bam, there it was. A display of God's power when the sea on each side began to stop. And a pathway was cleared around from one side to the other. And the Israelite people walked across on dry ground. Pharaoh said, we're going to pursue in after them. But what he had forgot is what had been declared. As you do unto my people, and so it shall be done unto you. And as they find themselves in the middle of the Red Sea, the Lord decides then to close it back up. They get over there, the people, remember this with me, stay with me here. They get over there on the other side. Now, there are the widows, no food to eat, nothing to do. No food, no water. What are we going to do, Moses? They're grumbling, they're complaining the whole time. And all Moses ever spoke says, God is bringing us from here and he's carrying us yonder, baby. As Dick Vitale would say, we're going yonder, baby. No water. What do we do? The people are complaining about no water. Moses walks to a rock. And water comes out of it. Grab a hold of this. The people now are beginning to rely more and more upon this man. We don't have any of the waters bitter. What do we do, Moses? Cut a tree down. Where I come from, they called it chopping a tree down. Chop a tree down and throw it in there. I don't know why, but just do what he says. They throw the tree down into the water, chopped it down in the water. And the water that was bitter that was made sweet. We don't have anything to eat, Moses. What are we going to do? And all of a sudden, he tells them, says, I'm going to tell you something. In the morning, when you get up, there's going to be manna. going to be running down from heaven. Lord's going to feed you manna. And in the daytime, there's going to be a cloud that's going to guide us. And at nighttime, there's going to be a pillar of fire that's going to guide us. For 40 years, they wandered around in the wilderness under the direction of this man. And all of a sudden now, they're getting to the brink of the promised land. They can see. They can see their promise. They don't walk by it and walk by it and walk by it. God has done spoke great things to this man. And told Moses, says, Moses, I'm going to use you to bring children of Israel out of Egypt and carry them into the promised land. It's going to be a bland full of milk and honey. Moses, this man, there's millions or thousands of people looking to this Moses. And all of a sudden, the word comes to the camp. Moses is dead. Are you with me? Carry you a long way around the world. But I had to lay something down. Moses now. He's dead. I don't know if you can put yourself in this situation. But I thought about this. My dreams just left me. My dreams just gone. I spent 40 years following this man. And now you're telling me he's dead? What are we going to do? Where are we going to go? 
You ever come to a place in your life that you spent years and years and years and all of a sudden it seems like that dream dies? I come to let you know this morning that even though Moses is dead, what I think God was telling the children of Israel as he spoke unto Joshua, let the people know Moses may be dead, but the God of Israel, he's still alive. Come on, somebody. I don't know what has took place in your life, but I do know one thing, that the almighty God who sits on the throne of glory, he's still alive and he's still in power. I don't care what around you is dying. He's still alive. Whoo. Man. The people had done fixed their minds so much upon Moses that maybe God was trying to show them, this ain't about Moses, this is about me. Moses didn't bring you out. Moses ain't going to be the one that's carrying you in. He said, I brought you out, and I will be the one that carries you in. Moses may be dead, but that ain't stopping this train. The God of Israel, he's still alive. Let me share one more story. Turn with me to the book. Y'all got a minute? To the book of Luke chapter 7, verse 11. If I lose your attention, just hang on. I'll try to get it back. I'll tell you this last story right here. Moses may be dead. But the God of Israel, he's still alive. I don't know what's happening in your life. But the God of Israel, he's still alive. He's still on the throne. Regardless of what the government has said, regardless of what world leaders have said about him, it just still does not change who he is. He is still the king of glory. In the book of Luke chapter 7, verse 11, it came to pass... The day after that he went into a city called Nain. Many of his disciples went with him and much people. Now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, a dead man being carried out. The only son of his mother. Man. And she was a widow. And much people of the city was with her. I want you to look first. Let me go on with me. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, weep not. And he came and touched the briar, the coffin that he was in, that she, her son was in. And they that bury him stood still and said, young man, I say unto thee, arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak. And he delivered him to his mother. And there came a fear on all. They glorified saying, God saying, that a great prophet has risen among us. And that God has visited his people. I want you to look here just a minute. I look at this woman. Not only is now that she has had a son to die, but her husband has died. I just try to put myself in these situations and place myself there to see what was going on with this woman. Her husband had died, someone that she had been in covenant with, someone that she loved. Now he was no longer in her life. The only thing that she had left was a son. Son probably just him, just them two. I suspect that a mother and the only son that she has, boy, they're really growing close to each other. He, she's dependent a lot on him to get chores done around the house. She's dependent upon him to go milk the cows and feed the horses and carry water down to the hogs. Is anybody with me? But not only that, it was something that had been in her, that had been birthed in her. 
She had carried this baby for nine months and now she has given birth to him. And now the boy she's put, it's her dream. It's everything that here he, this is what, this is all I have. It's this little boy left. And now he's dead. They take him and they put him inside of a coffin. Probably people may look at different things, but I'm just using this as a spiritual terminology. That when people are placed in a coffin or that man has declared it's over. Man says it's over. There's no more use here. We've done all we can do. So now we're going to place him in this coffin. The next act is to bury my dream. To bury my boy. And they have all the pallbearers there and they have the funeral possession and all the friends are over. And they, they got the little boy up. And the mama, she's back there crying and she's weeping. She's about to bury that which has been very, very close to her. All hope had seemed to be gone. Everything that she had lived for was now going down the drain. They had the pallbearers and they toting this little baby boy. Maybe there's some mourners that are there. They're weeping and crying. And all of a sudden, as they begin to go and pass through the city gate, there was a man by the name of Jesus. I call him in this long-legged Galilean. Coming over the horizon, him and his entourage. He's got his disciples with him, and here they come. And all of a sudden, his death is coming out of the city. Whew. Life is coming in. They have a little boy. It looks like it's over. But life and death were about to meet and collage, clash at a city gate. Whew. It was there that Jesus stopped this procession that was going on. He stopped where the coffin was at. He touched it. He spoke to the young man, arise up out of there. I come to let you know this morning, I don't know what is going on in your life. I don't know where you've been. I don't know what has died. I don't know what you've lost. I don't know where your dreams is at. They may be all dead. I don't know. But I come to tell you today that the God of Israel, he's still alive. He's able to bring back that which has died in your life. He's able to resurrect, to restore, bring new life. This is what he does. Regardless of what the people are saying, what the people are saying about you, regardless of what you've been through, the God of Israel, his name is Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the resurrection and the life he's able to restore. Whew. Man. Just touch your neighbor one second and tell him say it ain't over yet. Woo. It looked like it was over until life showed up. It looked like it was over for the Israelite people. But the word that came to Joshua and the Lord had told him, says, wherever you go, I'll be there. Resurrection and life. It ain't over yet. It ain't over yet. I don't know what God is going to do in your life. But I know what he's capable of doing. I'm going to stand with the three Hebrew boys. As they was about to approach the lion, about to approach the fiery furnace. And be cast into there. Just paraphrasing it. I don't know which one was a spokesperson. But one of them spoke up and said, Nebuchadnezzar, let me tell you one thing. I don't know what God is going to do, but I know what he's capable. <laughs> I don't
don't know what he's going to do when we get in the fire. But I know what he's capable of doing. Woo! I don't care how hot it is. I don't care how many lines is in the den. I still come to declare him, there is a God in heaven and his name is Jesus the Christ, the son of the living God. It ain't over yet. Woo! I want you to stand your feet this morning. Hallelujah. It ain't over yet. Been some things declared on your life. People told you you will never come out of it. Whew. Lord, help me here. Don't worry about my voice. I got a whole week to recuperate. He came. Ah, oh, Lord. Can y'all bear with me just a few more minutes? Lazarus, he's dead. Martha's crying. My brother's done died. They done sent word to Jesus. Get it. Where are you at? Where are you at? He shows up three days late, as they supposedly say. I don't know if something about them three day, that three day deal. Come on, somebody. Martha said, where was you at? Said, if you'd have been here earlier, maybe there'd have been something you could have done. Very interesting you read this story. I, I don't know just what Martha was thinking in this passage and what was going on with her. But she makes the comment Lord, if you would have been here, he would not have died. She understood that he had power over sickness and disease. She also understood that he had relationship with God the Father. Because she said this. She said, I know that whatever you ask the Father, he'll do it. She said, but he's dead now. In other words, there's some things that done went too far. And Jesus said, he shall rise again. You better tell your neighbor, said, it ain't over yet. It just looks like it. <laughs> it just looks like it. You think it's over, it ain't over yet. I know he shall rise again at the resurrection. And Jesus stopped. I don't know how he done this. He looks back at Martha. Has to say, who do you think? I am. I am the resurrection and the life. And Lazarus may be dead. But the God of Israel, he's still alive. forth Lucy and let him go come on let's sing this one with some prayer partners up here in the front this morning some of you facing some difficult situations in your life some of you need salvation in your life Jesus is calling your name seem like everything you've had has been lost it's not over yet he's a, he's able to he's able to restore life He's able to restore the things that have been broken. Lord, help me here. Lord, help me here. Mm. There's some things that died in your life. There's some things that aren't dying. You want to grab your towel and say, it's over. It's over. I'm telling you, you need to grab a banner and stick it in the ground. He said, it ain't over yet. It ain't over yet. The Lord is my banner. Hallelujah. If you need special prayer for sickness, whatever it may be this morning, the altars are open here. There's some prayer partners and the altars open on each end. Feel free to come up here and pray. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
现在爱是 the savior say, and I strength indeed is small. The child of weakness, watch and pray. I find in me thy all in all. Jesus.